Hi there, everybody. We're going to begin the Chapter 5 lecture for AP Environmental Science. This chapter is titled Environmental Systems and Ecosystem Ecology. This is the first chapter that's going to really get into major environmental topics. So this is a, 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 a very important chapter. Um, the central case. Your, your, your book has a central case to, for every chapter. And your central case in this one talked about uh, what's happening in Chesapeake Bay. Well, Chesapeake Bay is a bay where a river runs into it, and that river um, has pollutants in it, and those pollutants are having an impact on the sea life in the bay. What are those pollutants doing? They're causing hypoxia, which is uh, depleted oxygen levels in the water. There's another name for it. They might call it a dead zone. A dead zone is an area that is experiencing hypoxia. What is a watershed? Well, all the land in an area drains into a river or streams, and then those rivers and streams eventually make their way downstream, and downstream they'll end up in the bay. So the watershed, this will come up again in our chapter on water and rivers and streams, is the land that pretty much filters or dumps into the, the local or nearby stream, and eventually that stream makes its way to a river, and then that river makes its way out to the ocean. This whole chapter is going to be about systems, so large areas, large systems, and how they impact each other. So it's going to be a lot of cause and effect. So this is a major chapter on environmental science because it's going to really delve into some of these really, really major environmental issues that we have on our planet. Some of them you have never even heard of or never even realized that they were a problem. Let's first talk about systems that are balanced. Negative feedback loops are systems that have balance, basically. So something pushes the system in one direction, well, then the system responds with the opposite. That's why they call it a negative feedback loop. Responds with the opposite, and in turn, the system goes back to stability. All right? So any type of scenario or a system that leads to stability, we are talking about a negative feedback loop. All right? Nature, if left alone, if left alone, has negative feedback loops all over the place, creating the, you know, the balance that we have. Positive feedback loop. Now, this is what's happening due to humans. Humans basically are altering systems. And when we alter systems, uh, we get what's called a positive feedback loop. Positive feedback loops are not good. They shift a system farther out of balance. A good example of one would be um, a farmer clears some land, basically, some, you know, cuts the trees down from an area so that they can open up land for farming, okay? So they cut the trees down so they have all the soil present so they can farm. Well, when you cut down trees and you expose soil, that leads to erosion, okay? So that soil that they're dependent on over time is going to be gone because there's no more plant life holding it down. So now you cut down trees to open up space for farming, you get more erosion, and now you don't have suitable land. So what do these farmers then do? They go find another area and cut down more trees. And then the same thing happens again. They grow food on it for a short period of time. They get massive erosion. They no longer have good soil. So then they, what do they do? They cut down more trees in the forest. So this is a positive feedback loop. The albedo effect is a very important one. This is going to come up again when we talk about climate change later, but let's talk about it now. Um, albedo means... Um, an object's ability to reflect light. Okay, that's what albedo means. Well, on our planet, our planet is getting gradually warmer right now. Climate change is taking place. Some people believe um, it would be getting warmer whether humans were involved or not. My opinion or science is saying that humans are causing it to get warmer at a much more rapid rate than it should. So what's happening and where is this climate change having the biggest impact? Well, the biggest impact is not at the equator. The biggest impact is at the polar areas, specifically like somewhere in northern Alaska where you have a lot of uh, glaciers, all right? So areas on our planet that have the biggest effect due to climate change are the north, far north, far south, Arctic areas. And here's why they're having, the, they're having the biggest temperature changes on the planet. Well, the far north, for example, let's talk about Alaska, northern Alaska, or parts of Alaska where you have glaciers. Well, glaciers have an ability, ice has an ability to reflect light. So ice has a higher albedo, okay? So it can reflect light. So therefore, this light isn't absorbed and it's not turned into heat. So they reflect a lot of light, and in a sense, they keep the area colder or cooler, 
all right? Well, what happens? Well, humans are burning a lot of fossil fuels, causing carbon dioxide levels to get to astronomical numbers, and that excess carbon dioxide is heating the planet. So as people burn carbon and warm the planet, so the planet's getting warmer as a result of us, this ice starts to melt, okay? Now that the ice is melting, more of this, more of the sun's radiation is being absorbed by the water and the land that's being exposed, okay? And it's actually making the area even warmer, further causing more ice to melt. So Earth is getting warmer, so ice starts to melt. There's less albedo, which means the area now gets even warmer and even more ice melts with less albedo. And now the area gets warmer more ice melts, less albedo, the area gets warmer and warmer and warmer. So it's causing a, a positive feedback loop. This is actually happening. And this is why on an AP test, if they ask you where on the planet, or if you saw a map and they said, where on the planet would we be experiencing uh, the biggest effect of climate change? And you would pick colder regions, far north or far south. That is, and that is specifically because of the ice that is melting and the albedo effect. Equilibrium or homeostasis, this is balance. So when a system is left alone and everything finds its balance, we say it's homeostatic or has homeostasis or has dynamic equilibrium, okay? This term here, emergent properties, it just means you take a whole bunch of parts and you add them up and you don't just add up the parts to what the system becomes. You multiply the parts. So the system becomes much bigger than just the parts. You can think of it as your, as your body as a system. Uh, your or, For example, cells individually, they, they pretty much just perform respiration and stay alive. But you take all these cells and you add them up and you make tissue and you make organs. Now that those t tissue and organs have emergent properties, they, the whole system is much more powerful, much more, much, much bigger. It's not just adding up the parts, it's like multiplying the parts. The term synergy is kind of similar to it. Synergy means, you know, you don't just add up the parts, you, you multiply the effects of the parts. And that's what emergent properties relates to. This right here talks about air shed. So it's not only a watershed that can uh, you know, impact an area, it's the air. So this is the land or the air, basically the geographic area that picks up air pollutants. Air pollutants um, condense and precipitate. So they end up being a problem too. So different systems interact with each other. Okay, so water systems can be impacted by atmospheric conditions, okay? So we're showing you the connections between the two. Now, this is very, very important. This is a huge environmental science topic. It's called eutrophication. So this is what the central case was regarding the hypoxic dead zone. So eutrophication, this is like a definition. This definition might be missing some parts, but let me go over the detail of eutrophication. I'm gonna go over it in a picture with you in a second. What is happening with the eutrophication? You may have heard the common term, an algal bloom takes place. Well, an algal bloom is just one part of eutrophication, okay? What does it look like? It looks green, it looks murky, okay? And it's at the surface. And if you look at here, it's very surface. Water gets cloudy. Here in San Diego, we get um, algal blooms and we get eutrophication and we call it red tide. It happens in the summertime. If you ever go to the beach, you might see some brownish, reddish looking, murky, murky water. And that is eutrophication happening off of our coastal waters here. What causes this algal bloom to take place? Well, runoff, which means water carrying different things makes its way into the ocean or into a lake or into a stream. This happened all the time to Lake Murray when I was a kid. What was the problem with Lake Murray? They got runoff in the form of fertilizer from the golf course next door to it. So after a big rain, fertilizer ended up in Lake Murray. What did Lake Murray have afterwards? An algal bloom. Okay, it's not just fertilizer, it's anything that's carrying nitrates or nitrogen compounds or phosphorus or phosphates. Those are found in wastewater, detergents carry phosphates, um, sewage carries phosphates. So there's a, so the main nutrients, this influx of nutrients, you know, it's nitrogen or phosphorus input, okay? So what happens? Let's show you with a picture. Okay, so nitrogen and phosphorus make their way into a body of water. They make their way, and by the way, this is nitrogen and phosphorus, the element when they're dissolved, they're probably going to be nitrates and phosphates when they're found in the water or in the solution. 
Okay, so these are the main elements, but as dissolved elements, they're going to be nitrates and phosphates. That's the compounds that they will make. So they make nitrogen and phosphorus makes its way into a body of water. You get algae blooms, phytoplankton blooms at the surface. Okay, the water gets murky, it gets very green. All right. Well, these this algae, okay, it's kind of like a plant because it floor. It, these are plant nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, or any photosynthesizing organ and nutrient organisms nutrients so they make they would make plants do well but all that fertilizer made its way into a body of water now the plants or the phytoplankton of the body of water start to grow rapidly they flourish they actually um, even create a shadow on lower level plants affecting their ability to get light and grow so they inhibit the ability of lower level plants all right when this takes place you're your nitrogen or your phosphorus input causes this bloom or this massive growth of phosphorus, all right? Eventually, you're limiting th those nitrogen and phosphorus, but eventually it becomes limiting. Eventually, it starts to run out, and these uh, this phytoplankton, this algae starts to die, and you get organic sediments building up at the bottom, okay? These organic sediments, they're organic because they came from dead algae or dead uh, phytoplankton. All right. So now you get a buildup of all these organic sediments that float to the bottom. All right. What happens over time, these, these organic sediments, they decompose. All right. And the decomposition of these of these organic sediments leads to uh, a usage of the oxygen and an increase in the CO2 in the water. So what happens as a result of this? You get a dead zone. You get insufficient oxygen. You get hypoxia. All right, so let's review. This is a major environmental topic. It usually stems from humans using excessive fertilizers or growing a lot of food, and all that fertilizer makes its way from the watershed into the stream, and from the stream into the river, and from the river into the body of water. So that nitrogen or phosphorus makes its way in the body of water. Algae bloom or phytoplankton bloom. They eventually, you get too much, it's too dense of a population. You got a lot of competition for resources. Eventually, those limiting react re those limiting factors are no longer in place, and then you start seeing a massive amount of death due to the phytoplankton. The phytoplankton will die. Organic sediments build up. Those organic sediments got to go somewhere, so the bacteria decompose them. And as they decompose them, the bacteria are doing respiration. So the process of doing so to respiration will use up the oxygen in this body of water and create more CO two in the water. Less oxygen in the water means fish don't like it. You get a hypoxic or an area of low levels of oxygen. Parts of the planet right here. These are little major parts of the planet. So this was from our last chapter, the lithosphere, the rocky part of our couple chapters ago, that is. The atmosphere, we have a whole chapter on weather and air that's coming up soon. The hydrosphere, we're going to discuss it a little bit in this chapter and a lot more in another chapter. And the biosphere, the life portion of the planet. So hydrosphere, non-living, the water. The atmosphere, the air, the non-living. The lithosphere, the non-living, the rock matter. The living part of the planet, the biosphere. Okay. Ecosystems. Uh, Basically, we're living and non-living interact, all right? Living and non-living, the living, biotic, the non-living, the abiotic. So we're going to talk about energy flow and how it flows through these systems, all right? Primary production, gross primary production, and net primary production. Well, primary production is basically doing photosynthesis, all right? And what happens when a plant does photosynthesis? It makes sugar. It makes organic stuff. It makes plant tissue. That's what it does. So what's the difference between GPP and NPP? Well, gross primary production is the total chemical energy made. So all the photosynthesis that's taking place is gross primary production. Okay, Plants need some of what they produce to survive, and they need it. And what do they do to survive? Anything alive does respiration to live. So plants, in reality, will use a lot or some, not a lot, some of the sugar that they produce will be used and allow them to stay alive. All right. So not all of the sugar and all of the organic compounds made during photosynthesis are used by the plant. A lot of them are available for something else to come along and eat. Okay. So the energy that remains after a plant does its, photosy does its photosynthesis and its respiration, 
okay? Whatever's left over after respiration is done by the plant, that's called your net, that's called the plant's net primary production, all right? So the equation would be the net primary production equals the total GPP minus the amount of energy or the amount needed for respiration because plants need some to live and then the rest, NPP, is what's available for food, for example, for consumers in the area, all right? Um, you and me, we eat, okay? And then we produce ourselves. So that would be considered secondary production, okay? So primary production happens with photosynthesis. Secondary production happens as a result of consumption. That's how we produce our body and our tissue. Areas of the planet, different, different biomes or different geographic areas, they have different primary productivity, okay? If you look at this, desert is the bottom, the least primary productive. Open oceans, not very primary productive, okay? Tundras is right there, right above, a couple above desert. Lakes and streams are fairly low. Continental shelf is the area that you walk into the beach, you know, when, where you're walking on the sand and you're going into the water at the beach, all right? Then we go grasslands and so on and so forth. The very top is algal beds and reefs and then tropical rainforests. So the most biologically productive place on the planet would be like a coral reef, for example. And the coral reefs are getting destroyed by human impacts. Eutrophication is currently killing a lot of the coral reefs around our planet. Um, hypoxia as a result of eutrophication is destroying the coral reefs basically, all right? Swamps and marshlands, most people don't realize how productive they are. They're biologically productive areas. When I say productive, we're talking about primary productivity. We're talking about doing photosynthesis, okay? An estuary, in case you don't know what that is, that's where the fresh water of a river meets the salt water of an ocean, okay? Macro versus micronutrients. Well, nutrients are things that organisms need for survival, okay? The more we have of certain nutrients, the better we are, the healthier we are, okay? Um, macro, big, means we need a lot of these nutrients, and they're generally easier to get in our food that we commonly eat. And when I say food, I'm not talking about processed food. I'm talking about meats and fruits and vegetables, unprocessed foods, okay? Okay. Um, we already said nitrogen and phosphorus. These are very important macronutrients required for plant growth, which is why they lead to algal blooms. Micronutrients, things that are needed in smaller amounts. A lot of these are these metallic -y minerals that we get in our diet. Not all of them are metals. Chlorine is not a metal, but these are the, met the metals like the iron and the copper and the cobalt, the manganese, and so on and so forth. So micronutrients, we don't need them in as large of quantities. They're needed in larger quantities. Um, the limiting nutrient, okay, so nitrogen, so nitrates, for example, are usually would be a limiting nutrient in a marine system, okay, which is salt water. And in a freshwater system, you might notice phosphates. Well, my house is not, my house is salt free. I don't have a salt water pool. And my house has a regular pool where we put chlorine in it. And a problem that I commonly have in my pool is phosphates make their way into my pool. So if your pool ever turns green or if you ever see a green pool, that is a pool that probably has a high level of phosphates in it, which are now leading to algae in your pool. Your pool is going to get greenish or greenish yellow. Okay. Common in pools. And where does it come from? Well, it comes from plant matter that flies in your pool, leaves, they decompose, things of that nature end up in your pool. So a lot of phosphates in my pool sometimes. Yeah. All right. And this shows you an example of an algal bloom here. You have clear, not so murky water. Algal blooms, what do they do to water? When you get these, the water gets murkier. It's not, it's not as clear. You get shading on the at the bottom, you get a lot of sediments, organic sediments build up at the bottom. Generally has a high level of nitrates or phosphates in the water also. Um, when I was checking my pool recently, I noticed a lot of algae growing in my pool. I checked my pool for phosphates and my phosphates levels were way out the roof. Yeah, they're way high. Ecotone, just a term. So you have ecosystems or biomes, they, they border each other. So this would be like a forest and a grassland bordering each other. Well, there's kind of like an in-between area that's kind of foresty. It's kind of grassland in this area. That would be called an ecotone. Okay, an ecotone. 
In San Diego, our biome is, is chaparral, but we have deserts right next to us. So you have areas that are chaparral, but desert. They're a little bit of, they're a little bit of both, basically. Those would be ecotones. Landscape, landscape ecology, and patches. Well, we spoke in an earlier chapter, and we talked about certain um, animal species being endangered um, from extinction. And one of the problems is we said that those are generally endemic species and an island dwelling species. So let's talk about islands. Well, on land, land is not technically an island, but humans fragment habitat. So what do we do when we cut habitat up into pieces? When we cut it up into pieces, we create patches, which are, for the most part, little islands that we've created all over the planet. So even though we would say, you know, these are terrestrial areas, land areas, they have been cut into pieces, so they behave more like islands. So the species that live or reside within these patches are affected by the landscape, by the terrain. If they can't leave their area to find a mating partner, well, now they're pretty much on their island and extinction and things of that nature um, increase as a result of that. So this is a cause. Patches are caused because of human activity. We cut landscape into different pieces, all right? Because of landscapes being cut into pieces, this is farmland, this is very common, we call it habitat fragmentation. This is very common. Organisms have a hard time, organisms that naturally reside in this area have a hard time finding mating partners. Creates, creates what's called metapopulations or subpopulations, okay? So these subpopulations are now limited to their mating partners and limited to their genetic variety, so it puts them at a higher risk of, of extinction, all right? So this these patches, have a, are caused by habitat fragmentation and these these they create subpopulations or meadow populations that are now more susceptible to changes so we create islands on land and we call them patches basically ecosystem services this has come up several times already in our book things we get from for free because of nature nature forms soil cleans air cleans water pollinates, pr produces our farm, our, our, our variety of crops that we like to eat. Um, bacteria break down and recycle things for us. Um, nature helps create negative feedback loops for us. And all these are very important things that we get for free from nature. And we're going to stop there.